All right, welcome everyone. Um, in the past, for about the last 15 years, we've had uh, a lecture each Sunday of Great Lent. Uh, this year, we started to add a monthly lecture outside of Great Lent, and we had a request uh, to focus on the Divine Liturgy, learning about the Divine Liturgy during this Nativity Lent. So this may be a one-off thing where we do this this year and never again, or it may be something that we do regularly. In any case, the Divine Liturgy is the most important divine service that we serve. It may or may not be your favorite. I happen to love Vigil. Not that I don't love Divine Liturgy, but theologically, unquestionably, the Divine Liturgy is the most important service that we participate in as Orthodox Christians. And so it seems that this will be a good opportunity for all of us to learn more. The first lecture will be given by Deacon Dmitry Mikhailov, uh, and then we will rotate. I don't think any one of us is giving more than one sermon. Next week will be Reader Dmitry Kapusta. Uh, he is also a, a seminarian, as is Father Dmitry, and we thought that we, we should do this with the seminarians, deacons, uh, and priests and share that load. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Father Dimitri and ask you to be attentive. And also, as he goes through the pieces that he's doing, please try to take some notes, either mentally or on a piece of paper, so that when we're done with this lecture part, we'll be able to have a ni nice discussion. Without further ado, let's welcome Father Dimitri. I can't clap because I have coffee in my hands, but I bet some of you could. So let's welcome him. Everyone, uh, before I begin, just a small uh, note, I guess, to put forward. Uh, we have a very unique icon of Christ in the front of the church here, uh, not made by hands. Um, one of the important things to remember when you venerate this icon is you don't want to be like Judas. So don't kiss the face is a very important part of this. Um, what about other icons? No, not, not, no, 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 no faces. Um, but especially for this one, there's a very big temptation since obviously the face is the most prominent. Um, but we have, uh, it's purposely made such that he has hair on the right and the left coming down. Those ones are okay to kiss. Fabric, I guess you can. Uh, just try to avoid kissing the face. We always look and there's very big uh, prints left from people kissing right on the cheek, which is a bit of irony there. Um, but anyway, uh, moving forward. So, my lecture today is going to be about vestments. Basically, what are we wearing when we uh, uh, serve the services? Uh, in order to do this, I'm going to try to do actually a combined uh, clergy role slash what are they wearing kind of thing. So, um, let's start with the reader. So, reader is the first rank of clergy. Um, they are part of the uh, server subsection rather than um, uh, celebrants. Uh, and what does a reader do? Well, a reader maintains order and clear, on the clearos and maintains the books used for the service. So these are the guys who theoretically know where the books are that you need to read out of for any given service. Uh, what do they wear? Okay, so very first thing you know. So this is called a stakarium. So this was originally, you know, back in the day, this was the base layer of uh, clothing worn by everyday people. Um, it used to be that during the, again, this very early church, people would just uh, uh, stitch on crosses and uh, uh, like embroidery onto clo on the clothing uh, and set them aside, set them aside specifically for use within the divine services. Um, all, all cl uh, clergy and even the uh, non-tonsured uh, servers wear, wear a stakarin. Um But the priests and the bishops actually have one that's a little different where it's tight, tighter fitting. It's not as flowy. Um, so, I guess I should probably mention why, why, do we, why do we even wear these different things? Why do we not, you know, serve the liturgy and, uh, you know, the latest fashion or anything like that. Uh, well, if there's an interesting quote we have from Gogol, uh, from the book we actually have in the kiosk. Uh, we put on these vestments to be distinguished not from others, not necessarily to like see ourselves different from others, but even from ourselves, to separate ourselves from the earthly, to kind of 
put on these clothes to say, okay, we are not doing something that is engaged in the normal affairs of the earth. We are specifically doing something higher. Um, so, yeah, the, the, we, we, in the early days, this used to be ordinary clothes that they would embroider, put crosses on, and set aside specific for allergy. This kind of developed into its own specific set of uh, vestments that we wear these days. Um, so again, the first layer, if you will, uh, is the stakarian, which is uh, symbolic of the garment of salvation placed on all those who profess face, faith in Jesus Christ. So, uh, in a robe of light, if you will. Uh, yeah. Next, uh, orarian. So that is tied to the office of the subdeaconate. The subdeaconate is basically the person who corrals all the servers and uh, and times readers uh, in the altar and takes care of the vestments and the vessels. So they don't actually handle anything to do with the actual gifts as much as the the uh, cups and the plates and everything related to the gifts. Um, and again, maintains order. So these are the guys who are making sure that the liturgy actually smolt, uh, uh, flows smoothly for the priests, deacons, um, and bishops. Uh, specifically, these days, subdeacons have a lot of responsibilities related to the bishop. You don't get to see that that often at a parish level because the bishop comes about once a year, but they are in charge of vesting the bishop. They are uh, basically the bishop's right-hand man, uh, men. Uh, so what do they have? So they have an orari, which is... This. So, actually, originally the orarian was only for the deacons um, in, in the practical use. And the reason why for this was that this was used originally, uh, this was originally an embroidered scarf or towel that was used to actually clean uh, the mouths and just any spills, really, uh, uh, that happened when, when, when feeding people the, the, the gifts. Um, over time, you know, we decided, hey, maybe we shouldn't uh, just walk around with the stained uh, orarians all the time. So this, we have a specific, uh, separate one. We use the, you know, towels and napkins separately these time, uh, these days, uh, to wipe up any uh, spills or otherwise. Um, so, yeah, the the deacons have these. Um, uh, uh, clipped to the shoulder and are used in, to uh, announce ectenias. Uh, the idea behind this is that the econ, uh, econ, the deacon acts as an icon of the angels, uh, announcing prayers before the Lord. Um, and specifically for subdeacons, uh, they are girded in this in the shape of a cross. Uh, I guess I can show you. I don't. I can't do this with everything, but uh, I'm sure you've all seen this, but basically cross on the side, and the subdeacon carries on his business with this cross, girded as such. Um, yeah. Uh, moving on. Uh, deacons. So deacons are the next rank in clergy, and they are part of the celebrants. Specifically, they are a co-celebrant. So, uh, 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 assistant, assistant celebrant. So, they serve the holy table, but they don't, they don't um, minister. They are not ministers. They don't they don't run, if you will, the service. They help the ministers themselves to minister. So if you want to think of it that way, um, they, they cannot celebrate in of themselves. Uh, if you want to think of this ordering, just as the 12 apostles had 70 apostles, so does the priest have his, um, his own uh, assistants. Um, yeah, and what the priests, what the deacons have above the orarian, which is also what the subdeacon has, is they have cups. Um, these, these are the cups, um, and the cups are worn uh, 
to gird the tunic to keep the, uh, the actual uh, what did I think? Um, the the, the Cassock, if you want to. Cassock, yes. Um, uh, to keep to, to keep it like falling into anything, or uh, to, yeah, to keep it from falling into anything. Uh, these are all these are worn by all the major clergy, uh, priests, bishop. Everyone wears these. Um, yeah. Uh, next, uh, priests. So the priests are the ones that you. Uh, have the most attention on. Uh, they are the minister of the holy table, uh, and they serve the liturgy as Christ operates through the priests by the authority of the bishop. The priest cannot serve unless given such an authority by the bishop. Uh, so, priests are assigned to govern parishes or the local authority, uh, local communities within the diocese which we'll get to once we get to Bishop. Um, so the priest is a little different than the other ones in what he's wearing. As mentioned before, his um, stikarian is a bit different, tighter. But he also has a stole, which is what Father Gregory is currently wearing. Um, so this stole is a type of orarian, actually, but instead of being uh, attached in one side, it actually goes around his neck. And the... Um, the expression here is that it is a sign of their full service to the church rather than uh, as a minister of minister. He actually is the minister of the service. Um, Can I point out something? Some, an interesting point. When Archbishop Peter ordains a priest, he takes the deacon's orarian from his shoulder and he puts it over his neck. I actually have never seen a bishop do that before, but that's exactly what this is. He's the only bishop I saw that has ever done it, but it makes absolute perfect sense. Why take it away and then give another one? You just take what you're wearing, puts it over his neck, and then we tie that belt around him, and then he's vested as a priest. Um, yeah, and one thing that you may, I, I, to mention is the priest is given the authority to, to serve all the services except ordination. That is only something a bishop can do. He can assist during the liturgy of where an ordination occurs, but he does not take part of the, uh, in the ordination service himself. Um, yes. Uh, the second thing of note for that would be the uh, the belt. So uh, I should note that uh, I'm not going to recite them all, but all of these vestments for the deacons, priests, bishops. All of them have prayers associated with them when vesting into them during the divine services. Uh, these are said prior to putting them on. Uh, anyway, the belt. The belt is worn by bishops and priests, uh, and it signifies the strength of the Lord preparing the minister to accomplish his work. Uh, to be girded. Uh, reference that. Uh, the next is the... Polonium. This is an overcoat. This was originally, um, again, most of these things had its history tied to everyday things that were set aside specifically for the use in divine services. This used to be an overcoat. Um, this is a sign specifically that they are protected. Protected from, I don't want to say like demonic. From, from from outside influence, um, out from what is outside of the church, through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, the other two uh, investments of note are not available to us, I think. Sacros. Wonderful. You should tell what it is. So, um, Sakos was a... Who wears it? Uh, the emperor. Yes. The emperor wore it. Uh, bishop wears it. Uh, these days. Um, it was the sign uh, of their status as a ruler within the church. Um, again, 
harkening back to the times of the uh, Roman times, again, reference the emperor, uh, ruler of, uh, 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 ruler in the church. Uh, though this is not as much a sign of uh, nobility and, and uh, inner strength um, as much of uh, devotion and service and humility. Um, yes. And uh, the last one, really, of note is the uh, Omniforum, which is uh, Omniforium. Omniforium. Uh, this is a scarf that was worn by elders in the community, so this used to be signify the uh, elders within the community, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and, and it's the chief vestment of the bishop. Uh, it's the Again, it's kind of hard to reference without a picture or something, but... Uh, oh. Uh, yeah, like, uh, I mean, even if you look at St. Nicholas, he has one going across his uh, top there. Um, a lot of the bishop uh, icons that you see around you have one uh, worn. Um, yeah, and, and one thing I think to note here is that the bishop acts as an icon of Christ and is a su successor of the apostles. It is through the bishop that the grace of the sacraments flow. Um, grace does not originate from priests. It is from the bishop, specifically. Um, That's why the priest doesn't give a blessing when the bishop is present. Not because we don't love you, but because I can give a blessing because the bishop gives me a blessing to do that. But if he's here, I can't add to what he already gave you. That's the highest blessing you're getting. Um, Yes, as it is from Christ that the bishop uh, receives his authority as a bishop um, and grants, uh, gives grace, as it were. So if you want to think of ranks relative to icons, uh, bishop is icon of Christ, priests are the icons of the apostles, and the deacons are the icons of the 70 apostles, the, the uh, uh, I want to say lower apostles, but the working ones. The working ones. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's about it. Let me add a couple of things to what Father Dimitri said, um, that are probably maybe interesting to you, but, uh, I think it's good to know. Subdeacons, in the ancient church, when the deacons would call out for the catechumens to leave, the subdeacons would go throughout the crowd, make sure that all the catechumens were out, they would lock the doors, <laughs> and stand guard. Because in the ancient church, catechumens were not permitted to be present for the mysteries. Right? So when the catechumens are asked to leave, that's the end of their part of the divine liturgy. We don't send them out now. We don't have anywhere to put them uh, and to educate them. M maybe we'll do that in the future if we have the opportunity, because it does make sense in a way. But the ancient church was very strict about this. The catechumens were not present for the mysteries. And so the subdeacons would go throughout, make sure that they were outside, lock the doors, and stand guard. So that's interesting. We don't do that anymore. And the other thing that might be interesting to you is the bishop's vestment, the sapos that he wears. That's a really, re that's a, a relatively recent innovation in the church. Bishops used to wear a felonium, just like the priest, just what I had on the overcoat, as Father Dimitri was, was explaining. And then on top of that would be their amaphorium, always made with white wool. Why? Because that was an easy fabric to get. The lamb that's gone astray, that's held on the shoulders of the shepherd to bring it back to the flock. So the most traditional or uh, amaphorian is made with white wool. And the, that would be worn over the priest's vestment. And that's how you could tell who was a bishop and who was a priest, was just by the amaphorian that they wore. The, during the imperial uh, Byzantine times, that developed and eventually the emperor's garment became also the garment of the Patriarch of Constantinople. And then right after that, all the rest of the bishops said, I want one of those, and that was that. Um, but still, sometimes you see bishops wear uh, a priest-like vestment, especially if they're serving in a mission or something like that, or if they're serving a service when there's not deacons and subdeacons and so on and so forth. They have, you can still get these vestments that look like a priest's vestment, and that the Amaphorian goes on top of that. So... Um, you don't see that from Christ the Savior in Moscow because there's a million subdeacons and a billion de deacons. But uh, in many of the other dioceses, especially the new small dioceses in Asia, you see that all the time because there may not even be a subdeacon in the whole diocese. Okay, that was really great, Father. Thank you for doing that. Does everybody, does anyone have questions?
Marina. I got two actually. Um, what are these things that you're wearing now? First question. And the, the second question is so the philo. Um, Overcoat. Overcoat. Um, <laughs> no. Philo. <laughs> there is no, there is no English. <laughs> This one is a particular Russian style, right? Ah, good, good point. Can, can you answer the first one? I'll answer the second. Sure. So, what we are currently wearing is two two sets of vestments. They are not vestments. Yeah, kind of vestments. Um, the Madrasnik, which would be equivalent to a undercassock, and then the Ryasa, which is the like a proper cassock. The difference is the sleeve. The difference is the sleeve. And who can wear the, the riasa? It's deacons, priests, and bishops. Uh, below that, the clergy only wear the padrasnik. And Pod riasnik, under the riasa. That's what the riasa symbolizes. It symbolizes the grace of the Holy Spirit, that this person is an ordained person, that they, they're, they're in the upper clergy. <coughs> now, it used to be in the... And before Peter, in the Russian church, this is how you could tell a priest and a deacon apart. Nothing. You couldn't. <laughs> you couldn't. So it, what? Only in the Russian church do priests always wear crosses. No matter what what rank of priest you are, from the day you are ordained, you wear a cross. Why? Because Peter went to get a a blessing, as the emperor would get a blessing from a priest, but he went to a deacon, and that kind of didn't go very well. And so from that time forth. The Russian Church began to have crosses for even the junior priests. In all the other Orthodox churches, only archpriests, only old priests generally, wear have a, a cross, which is like a jeweled cross. But that silver cross that that like Father Colin wears, you don't find that anywhere except the Russian Church. That way, you can immediately identify a priest. Like you would hate to go out and kill a deacon if you were after a priest, right, or whatever. So you can immediately identify the priest by seeing that he has the cross. What was the second question? Oh, how it goes up in the back, right? If you've been to any other kind of Orthodox church, except the Russian church, the balloon sits on the shoulders of the priest. So we tend to want to have like really deep theological explanations for these kind of things. And this is a deep one, so pay attention. In Russia, it's very cold in the winter and the cathedrals are made from stone. When you open the doors, it's windy. So if you have something there, it blocks the wind. That's it. That is literally why it's there. So just like in, if you notice, you may not have noticed, but in the Russian church, the bishops have a, have a cover over their staff of, of vestment, right? Only in the Russian church. An equally deep theological reason, because metal gets really cold when it's winter. And in Greece, you don't have any winter like that, right? So they don't need that. But in the Russian church, rather than having the bishops have frostbite constantly, that developed. So sometimes there are really deep theological reasons that we do things, and other times it's just totally practical. And those two things are an example of total practicality. It's not a theological question. Um, so we all know that there's different colors that need certain things. Um, how did that come about to be in the Russian church? Because from what I understand, it's not in the like Greek church, for example, or I don't know, but just when did that come in about the, in the church history? Yeah. Uh, so, Father Gregory probably has a better explanation than me, but strictly speaking, all these variety of different vestment colors is a new invention. Um, or traditionally, even by the Tipica, uh, all you need to really have a full set of vestments is something light and something dark. Uh, normal days and feast days, and then uh, uh, Lenten times. Um, yeah, it's exactly right. In the, in the Tipicon, it only specifies dark and light. But the Russian church, as you may know, had a lot of Western influence in it. Not just in the South. We think, oh yeah, okay, so in Ukraine there was a lot. Entire Russian church. Honestly speaking, our seminaries, until like the end of the 19th century, were just exact carbon copies of Roman Catholic seminaries. Exact. Same books and everything. And so 
that was reformed then, and then there was a revolution and so on and so forth. But the point is that we have a lot of Western influence. And although we don't use the same colors as they use in the West, that idea of having a great color palette uh, of many different color vestments, that's really just a Russian practice. Doesn't mean it's wrong, doesn't mean it's right. It's authentic to the Russian church. There are even differences within the Russian church. For instance, on Pascha, you are white, unless you serve at Dormition Cathedral in Moscow, which is like six guys. And that was always the case. There was never any deviation from that until the services start to go on the TV. Now in the entire Russian church, except the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, everybody wears red because they saw it on the television. And like, oh, they do that in Moscow. That must be what you're supposed to do. No, actually. Interesting. Metropolitan Eugene of Tallinn uh, was a higher monk at St. Sergius outside of Moscow, the, the great Lavra there. And when he was made a higher monk, they still wore, so that was like 30 years ago, they still wore white. So it is a super new thing for red to be used in Pascha. Uh, it was only, like I said, that specific place at Dormition Cathedral in the Kremlin, and it sort of spread throughout. So even within the Russian church, there are some differences. Uh, but the point is that each color has a meaning, and we don't have to go into it into great detail, but you probably know some of them, like blue is mother of God, right? White, it's for mostly feasts of the Lord, but... Green would also be for Palm Sunday and Pentecost. So, like, there are reasons. There are reasons, and they usually have something to do with the feast. Like, palms are green. Vestments are green. Pentecost, the scent of the Holy Spirit gives life to everything. Right? It's spring in the northern hemisphere. Vestments are green. So, it, 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 the, these things have some story behind them. But as Father Dimitri said, strictly speaking. Dark and light. So if you go to like a Serbian, big service of Serbian priests, let's say you get to go to Novogratchanica, north of Chicago, there's the bishop, there's 40 priests, there's going to be like at least 30 different colors, not 40. Like, because everybody will just bring whatever they whatever they got. It doesn't matter. They, they don't have to match the bishop or anything like that. So it's just a, a completely different approach. Not right or not wrong, but the Russian church is the one that has that very specific color scheme. Uh, that has now invaded some of the churches in Central Europe just because of the Russian influence. But strictly speaking, there's just dark and light. <laughs> what are the priests that are a deacon wear when they're like, just out and about? Like if you're not comfortable? So as a deacon, I don't actually, there's no, I don't need to wear this when I'm out and about. Uh, I don't tend to wear this when I'm out and about. Uh, Priests, it's a different thing. It is ex generally expect. Oh, I'll, I'll let you say, but generally it's expected for the priest to maintain uh, the 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 uh, cassock while while out and about. Uh, kind, of, kind of depends on the context. Um, if I'm running to the store and I'm working in the yard, I am not putting on any of this. Right? I'm already dirty. I'm not getting this dirty. These things are hard to wash. If I'm going to do something as a priest. Then I'm definitely wearing this. So the, the street garb is both the riasa and the pedrasi for a priest and a deacon. If you if we were going to do some service in the middle of Ann Arbor, once we finally converted the whole place and we have in the, in the city hall, we have some big service, we're going to show up wearing this, right? But if, if uh, we had a rule in Jordanville, you weren't allowed to wear these things when you were working on machinery and it was a farm monastery plus a printing press. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities to get your hands crushed. And when a priest gets his right hand crushed, he can't serve as a priest anymore. So that kind of doesn't make any sense. So in, in Jordanville, we had a rule, no uh, no labor with machines in in anything except a shirt and pants. No, no cassock at all. Because it did happen that one of the priests got his hand stuck in the printing press and it, and it crushed, his, crushed his hand. Uh, and so after that, the rule was put into place, no cassocks when you're using machines. So it just depends on the context. The gardener wears one. On the farm, they don't. Does that answer the question? Good. Julia has a question and then Jake. Um, so how do you say no, how is it hot? Is it hot? Like, is it hot? Is it hot? Is it hot? Well, whenever anyone turns up the church temperature to 70 something, we, we feel it. Like it's. Well, we'd rather be hot for a little while than hot forever. So we're not complaining. 
They, no, it, it, it varies, yeah. It, it varies. Like, this This is all really light polyester. It doesn't read that well, but it's very light. If you, they have, you know, winter ones that are, you know, wool, or they even have really fancy ones if you want to have, like, um, uh, mink uh, fur lines. That's what I wear. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, so it's kind of a personal thing, like what kind of fabric you like, honestly. Um, so you can get ones that are unbearably hot. You usually do that once in your life, and then you're like, I'm not getting another one of those. But um, there are heavy ones, there are light ones. For merry clergy, actually, we can wear any color we want. We don't have to wear black. You can, if you look at the few color pictures that there are of St. John of Kronstadt, he's got all kinds of amazing colors, because people used to just send him fabric and things like that, and he'd just have it made into, into uh, the riasas. So there's no, there's no hard and fast rule. I try not to wear gray or blue or other light stuff during Lenten periods, but that's just like my own thing. There's, if I wanted to, on the first day of Great Lent, I could do the services in white. It would be kind of silly, but I could. There's, there's no rule about the uh, Marian clergy. Monastic clergy wear dark, period. Black or brown is, is acceptable for monks, dark blue. It doesn't have to be black. Sometimes black fabric is expensive, depending on where you are in the world. But for monks, it has to be dark. But for for white clergy, for married clergy, whatever we want. Jake, you have a question. I mean, uh, a lot of the vestments are based on like a tunic, which is, is what people used to wear really up until recently. Um, but is it still acceptable for like laymen to wear a tunic to church, like men, theoretically? Father Dimitri blesses it. I have no problem with uh, it. I mean, is there a length limit? Like, well, <laughs> the things that you don't want to, you want to be distinguishable from clergy. Is kind of the point. Right, know? I wouldn't wear so, like, not that I wouldn't. No, no, no. I mean, like, there's no, there's no uh, restriction in that sense. I mean, strictly speaking, you can come in a full, you know, Scottish regalia if you feel like it. You know, a kilt and everything. Oh, actually, I don't know. Kind of, well, this doesn't look like a woman's person. Yeah, the, well, the point is, there's there's no restriction on laity what, what, what it is that they wish to wear to church, as long as it is, you know, your your Sunday best, the good good clothing that you bring to church in, in, in respect for, for, for the Lord. One of the reasons that we wear this is because when, you, when you're ordained, you should become, you should, the, the, your outside appearance should reflect your inward stability and sobriety and other virtues that you should be trying to um, garner and strengthen rather than worrying about the fashion of the times. So it's just, you know, fashion will change. Someday men will wear tunics again, probably, but we'll still be wearing the same thing. It's a good question. Lori. Where are these vestments made? A variety of locations, and most, I, I mean, even our dear uh, Mashka, Kate, uh, Catherine, um, who's, uh, I think they left uh, with Father Colin, um, she, she actually makes some of these. I, I think these are actually were made by her. Yeah, um, the blue ones that, that Father was showing are made by Katie. Yeah, so um, the uh, monasteries... Uh, convents, I guess even, you know, factories in a way, um, uh, and, and a lot of, even even to the individual tailor can make them, so. It also depends on if you are buying something that's custom made to fit you, or if you're buying something off the rack. It's just like clothes that we buy or buy at the store. You can get something custom made, it costs more expensive than something you buy off the rack. So most priests and deacons know their exact size. And most, for most priests and deacons, they can find that uh, when they go to a vestment uh, air store. Okay, hey, anything else? Yeah, I have a Any other questions? Great, Father Dimitri, thank you very much. Excellent. Please plan to join us next week for our next lecture. And in the kiosk, we have an excellent book by Gogol about the Divine Liturgy. Where you and you can pick that up in English, and then there are other ones in Russian. <coughs> we don't have the Google one right now, but we have others. Sveta can tell you about that. She'll make you a great deal.